Congress and Healthcare in 2014 conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Larry Vernalia. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. This is Larry Vernalia. I'm the chair of the healthcare practice uh, here at uh, Foley and Lardner, and we'd like to welcome you uh, to join us today for this uh, healthcare practice group briefing on uh, hot topics with a terrific view uh, from the Hill, uh, as reported by our friend Lisa Graber. There are 300 or so uh, friends and clients of Foley and Lardner on the line. Um, a number of you have had the opportunity to, uh, to chat with us about uh, our perspectives on recent de legislative developments in healthcare. Uh, but this is a perspective that, that you don't get all the time. So in the next 30 or 45 minutes, we will try to share with you a briefing, a point of view, and an opportunity to ask questions uh, all before lunch. So let me turn it over to my friend and colleague, Scott Klug, to introduce our speaker. Scott is the uh, Public Affairs Director here at Foley and Lardner. At where he represents a variety of our healthcare and other clients, both at the federal and the state levels. And before that, he served as a congressman for eight years, representing Madison, Wisconsin. And he developed a deep expertise in healthcare, insurance, and other sectors, which makes him, uh, from our perspective, a terrific translator of the complexities of the healthcare industry uh, into the political process. And I'm going to ask Scott to introduce Lisa, who uh, does exactly that uh, today on the Hill. So, Scott? Thanks, Larry, and good morning, everybody. I'm uh, part of Foley's uh, National Public Affairs Practice. We've got a bipartisan team in Washington headed by a former Democratic congressman, Dennis Cardozo, who's from California, and myself. I uh, am the Republican in the gang. I served on the Energy and Commerce uh, Health Subcommittee for eight years when I was uh, in the legislature. Um, I'm delighted to have Lisa Graber with us today. Uh, Lisa works with us on a number of clients. She's uh, very kind to take time out of the two-week break that Congress has. Actually, she hasn't gotten much of a break because while members are gone, it allows staff um, to get a lot of important things done where the House members and the Senate members aren't driving their staff and the committee staff crazy, as they so often do, and which I often did when I was there. Um, Lisa is a Chicago native, a University of Wisconsin graduate, um, she began her career in healthcare working at CMS in the program integrity section. Um, after that, she did a stint at the American Hospital Association, and she's been with uh, Chairman Camp on the Ways and Means Committee and the Health Subcommittee for just about two years. Um, so what we did to kick this program off was to send Lisa um, a half dozen bullet points on some issues that uh, we had clients ask about in recent weeks. Um, so I'm going to ask Lisa to sort of run off that sort of tick list we sent her. And then, as we said, we'll try to leave another 20 or 25 minutes for questions. Lisa actually has to go back into conference on uh, a post-acute reform bill they're working on. So her schedule's tight, so um, I don't want to take up any more of it. Lisa, thanks for being with us. Great. Thank you, Scott. And good afternoon, everyone. Happy to uh, provide you a quick perspective on what the Congress um, is looking at right now in terms of the Medicare program. As Scott mentioned, I handle the Medicare Part A portfolio on behalf of Chairman Camp for the Ways and Means Committee in the U.S. House. Now, the first thing on my list to give you a perspective on is the prospects for a permanent fix for the Sustainable Growth Rate, or SGR. Um, as you may be well aware, this at the end of March, we, Congress passed a one-year patch for the SGR if the Congress had failed to act, um, which is a good thing we didn't, by April 1st of this year, a negative 24% cut to Medicare physician fee schedule services would have gone into place. So it was important for the Congress to act, and we act in a temporary um, patch fashion, as we like to say, on the Hill. Um, and most of the members in the House and the Senate were took a very hesitant vote to do that SGR patch. Um, we had made a lot of progress. The Committees of Jurisdiction, Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, and the Finance Committee in the Senate came to a six-party bipartisan bicameral agreement on a policy to fully repeal the SGR. And there was a lot of momentum moving into the patch, and there was a question um, as to whether or not, instead of doing a patch, we might do a permanent solution. 
And we got pretty far in discussions, and we really didn't make enough progress in the time that we had available on how to pay for the SGR patch. And that's always the big question for the U.S. Congress. It's really difficult to come to consensus around different areas to look at to find the funds necessary to pay for the SGR. So the prospects, I think, for a permanent SGR fix are very strong, and I um, have a lot of faith in the exercise, mostly because when we watched the reaction of our members to the patch, we knew that pursuing full repeal of the SGR was something that they're really dedicated to and they would like to see done. So as staff over the next couple of months, we will be getting together to try to see if we can come to consensus on offsets and way to, ways to pay for the SGR. So that's sort of the next exercise that's on the horizon. Um, it's kind of nice to be able to engage in those discussions without a deadline looming um, because we have up until April of 2015 um, before we have to address the SGR issue again. So we do have quite a bit of time and that's a good environment to have discussions on around offsets. So uh, the dream for permanently repealing the SGR I think is still very alive and well and um, look forward to uh, pursuing more of that in the coming months. The next item I had on my tick list is something that I've done an extensive amount of research and, and work on, and that's around the issue of um, what I like to call kind of a, a three-headed monster, um, the difference between inpatient and outpatient payments, um, CMS's policy that they put in place around two midnights, the audits associated with contractors working around that, and then the third part of that um, is the Medicare appeals process. And um, there are a lot of people looking at this particular issue right now, and frankly, I think it's, it's kind of a huge mess right now in the Medicare program. Um, there have been for some time now, a lot of audits building up from the recovery audit contractors, the RACs, who have explicitly been looking at short stays that, are been, that have been billed inpatient by hospitals. Um, the RACs have denied those for purposes of medical necessity um, to the tune at around a 90% rate. So most of those claims, um, if they've been short stays, have been denied at a very high rate. And this has caused a lot of problems for hospitals and the care that's being delivered because the RACs are denying them because they think that they may have been more appropriately billed as outpatient services and there are quite a substantial difference in reimbursement between inpatient and outpatient for hospitals. Um, so we're hearing from a lot of hospitals on this particular issue. We did on the Ways and Means Committee introduce a bill that would do a couple of different things. The first thing, and that was actually signed into law with the SGR patch, this past March was to extend sort of the moratorium that CMS has in place for RACs around auditing of short stays. So we extended that as a Congress six months beyond where CMS already was. So it will take hospitals um, into the first half of fiscal year 2015. So at least around the short stay medical necessity denials, um, we have given hospitals some temporary relief, and that was something that the members of the Ways and Means Committee were um, very committed to doing. Beyond that, um, the bill that was introduced also has a couple of other sections, and it does concentrate and signal on directing the secretary to begin to explore um, what some people call the equivalent of a short stay outlier payment. And that's really looking at the services that are very short stay, that are still medically necessary, but really gets into the nitty gritty in the payment differential between inpatient and outpatient payment. And um, I think that there's going to be much more development towards a policy in this area moving forward. Um, we've bought ourselves some time, I think with the temporary delay in the rack moratorium, but we really do need to start working with stakeholders to get a more permanent solution in place around looking at those short stays. And then the final part of it, which has been very concerning for a lot of members on the Ways and Means Committee, is the dynamic that's in place with Medicare appeals right now. I'm sure as everyone on the line knows, there's quite a high turnover rate um, as hospitals take cases to the third level of appeal or at the administrative law judge, the ALJ level. And there's, there's a high rate of turnover of the appeals on these short stay um, services. 
And um, the administration has come out and has basically said that there is going to be a permanent two-year delay on any appeals that will be heard at the ALJ level. So at this point, the administration has put a process in place that is denying providers their basic due process rights. And so all of this is kind of associated with just a really broken system right now. And the committee will be looking at um, solutions to this very large problem. Um, very likely in the future going to be having a hearing on this topic. And then we do intend to introduce some legislation around all of these unique areas, the RAC audits, the payment differential, and Medicare appeals. So there's going to be a lot more coming on the horizon for that. The next item I have on my list is what the Medicare, what Medicare programs are facing um, sort of really budget constraints at this point. And I would say that, you know, generally speaking, all Medicare programs are re really facing a budget squeeze. But in particular, uh, as Scott mentioned at the beginning of the call, the committees of jurisdiction over the Medicare Part A benefit are taking a really good look at post-acute care services right now in the Medicare programs. And that's been a focus um, for quite some time. And we're looking at solutions because post-acute care, and when I say post-acute care, I'm really talking about home health services, skilled nursing facility services, rehab hospitals, and long-term care hospitals, are a part of the Medicare continuum that really is not managed well in the Medicare program. We don't have standards in place that allow hospitals to effectively know what the proper right setting is for a patient to be discharged to after they've been treated in the hospital. We don't have quality metrics in place that indicate what are the high performing post-acute care facilities. And so part of um, what I'm working on right now with my colleagues is establishing standardized data across all of the post-acute care settings and quality metrics. So in the future, we have much more confidence when we're discharging patients um, from the hospital facility into post-acute care that they are going to high quality appropriate settings. And so that's one of the things that we're focusing on in that aspect. The next item I have on my list is um, around ICD-10 standards. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people were surprised to see a delay of ICD-10 implementation in the SGR patch that was just signed into law. Um, we had heard um, as committee staff um, mostly a lot of pushback from the physician community that they're not ready um, and they have a lot of concerns about CMS's ability to take some of the physician services and transition into ICD-10. Um, I will say, in terms of what I hear from most hospitals um, outside of the physicians, is that most, most hospitals are ready and have been ready for quite some time to transition over to ICD-10. So um, I think in the, the one-year delay that we do have in place right now, Congress will be working um, and probably pushing CMS towards making sure we have the back-end systems in place, testing to demonstrate that they are fully ready and capable of accepting a whole new classification of codes in order to process for claims processing. And the last item that I have on the tick list are any changes um, that will be in place in the future in the Medicaid benefit. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee doesn't have jurisdiction over Medicaid, but as the person who oversees hospital issues for um, the U.S. House, I do pay attention quite a bit to the Medicaid benefit because it's such an important part of what hospitals do focus on. And I think that we're going to just continue to see more and more states become much more creative about getting around and coming up with new solutions towards looking at Medicaid expansion. There's a lot of um, red states in the country who have opted now to not do the Medicaid expansion, um, but people are really starting to get into much more creative solutions. I think the state of Arkansas is a great example of that, and um, I expect to see more and more states to begin to take that same approach with their state legislators that Arkansas has and really lead the way and think about more creative solutions to try to get at um, more expansion of the Medicaid benefit. So that's a quick overview of uh, the opening remarks I wanted to make, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments you may have. So uh, this is Scott. I know Larry's got one to start with, and then if folks who are on the line um, want to ask a question, um, you can type it in. 
which you always can do, or you can actually just dial in a call in order to activate um, your ability to conference, and you just press star one. So, Larry, why don't you ask the one question I know you asked about, Lisa? Uh, I, I, did, I, did have, I did have one, but before I get there, I was curious to go back to your comments on the ICD-10 uh, delay. Um, if you can, how much of the delay was caused by concern about the agency's ability to uh, implement the new standards versus providers' ability to uh, navigate the many new codes? Um, I think that it was primarily more on the side of the agency's ability to demonstrate really uh, more on the physician side because I think the agency has done quite a bit with the crosswalk and testing of it for um, the hospital side. And so I think that much more of it was a concern around um, the agency's ability um, versus the pushback that we were hearing from stakeholders to actually physically change our systems and be ready for it. Uh, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so one of the questions that uh, Scott and I were kicking around is sort of what's your, what's your perspective on uh, CMS's uh, data dump, for lack of a better term, that came out earlier this week, you know, regarding some 880,000 physicians and all their uh, Medicare payments. Has the, did, did that come as a surprise to you, or had you, have you guys got a view on that? I don't, I don't think it came as too much of a surprise to us. Um, the agency has been in litigation um, sort of over the issue of transparency, especially around physician services, for many years at this point. Um, so I don't, I don't think for most people who have been closely following it that it was a surprise. I will say just anecdotally, um, it's been kind of fun to see the press pick up on certain aspects of it. The press has reported on um, certain physicians in the Congress who practice and family members of those physicians and have gone in and looked them up and sort of been banding around and reporting on those. That's been kind of fun to watch um, just because it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. But I, I do think that, um, you know, generally speaking, that it's good to have data publicly available. Um, and there have been a lot of questions that have also been raised about the usability of the data and potential unintended consequences associated with it. And that's something that we're paying really close attention to. Um, but in, in general, I think most of the members um, that we hear from, especially I can say for the Ways and Means Committee, um, one of our members, Paul Ryan, recently introduced a bill with Ron Kind um, around qualified entities for getting more use and access to Medicare data. And so that's something that we're really looking into and it's very, you know, closely tied to some of the stuff that CMS just recently released. And then there's also a bill in the Senate that's also very closely tied to what Mr. Ryan introduced. And so we are um, looking at, you know, potentially trying to get much more momentum behind getting just more data into the hands of people because we think it's really important and providers need access to it um, because we're, you know, we're tying more and more programs into law that ties performance to payments and without the data um, that puts providers in a tough spot. So I think that, you know, the future will have more and more transparency of this type of data. Okay, do we have people with questions on the line? Again, please star one. I saw um, a note here from Russ Blackford, but Russ, part of your question um, got clipped here, so I'm trying to make sure yeah, I can I, read this here. I think, I think, I think the question is, uh, is there any chance that we're ultimately going to skip ICD-10 and move straight to a next generation uh, classification of diagnoses, 11 or 12? If, if you know. um, I think in most of the people that I talk about with, um, we don't actually foresee that happening, unfortunately, um, because, you know, it's, it's a very good question to ask at this point since it's taken so long to do the transition. Um, but there are, you know, sort of enough concerns that actually just getting ready for ICD-10, um, I think it would be a much bigger haul to skip the system and get people ready for ICD-11. So. I, I don't actually foresee that happening. Thanks. Okay, again, questions for Lisa, star one. Here's another one from Jenny. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has even suggested, <laughs> sorry, this uh, 
having a hard time reading the slide here, the way this presentation is working. Larry, can you read the full question on your line? Sure. Yeah, the question is um, that the journal has suggested wiping the slate clean with respect to the costs of the SGR repeal. Um, and if the impasse on offsets continues, is there a possibility uh, that that might happen? And if it doesn't happen, uh, the question asks, is there realistically a way to offset the SGR costs without gutting other providers? Sort of a compound question. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, that Wall Street Journal article um, definitely had a lot of us, you know, kind of, hmm, that's interesting, you know, that the, even the Wall Street Journal is picking up on so what is sometimes a very nuanced, you know, inside the beltway, as we like to say, policy issue. Um, I, I don't foresee that, um, at least on behalf of the House, that we would be in a scenario where um, certainly outside of a very large deficit deal, um, that we would be able to pass the SGR unpaid for. Um, that's just, the, you know, the dynamics of the House and the, the majority that the Republicans have right now in the House mean that every single vote counts. And um, we've had a lot of very tough votes, even recently, um, getting all of um, even the Republican members on the same page. So I, I don't foresee um, that there's going to be just enough votes, even in the House, to um, get everybody on board with an unpaid for solution. Um, so, you know, a lot of solutions that people, I mean, especially the Senate has been talking about an unpaid for solution or um, using overseas contingency operations funds, OCO funds, to pay for the SGR, unfortunately just are not tenable positions that we think we can get 218 votes on in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, to, the, to the broader question on whether or not we will, in the discussion of permanent SGR, move and migrate away from provider cuts, I think that's definitely the goal of the House I can speak on behalf of. Um, we are very interested in looking at some structural Medicare entitlement reforms that I think um, can produce a significant amount of savings. And we do have, you know, some problems with um, Democrats on some of those policies because their, you know, general view is they sort of see those more as beneficiary cuts. And I don't necessarily think that that's the right way to think about it. But those are the types of issues that we need to talk through. Um, so if you're looking at things like combining Medicare Parts A and B, um, looking at income-related premiums for Medicare Parts B and D, in those two policies right there, we can find well over $100 billion to offset any SGR policy. Um, they're not easy policies for people to vote on, especially in an election year. Um, but I do think that they are some of the types of things that certainly the House will be looking to advance um, as we have these discussions on how to offset the SGR. This is Scott. You know, the sort of PAYGO strategy has been in place in Congress for about 15 years uh, and I think been embraced by both sides of the aisle. So now it gets really tough um, to make the SGR permanent fix work unless you can find offsets. And as you can imagine, most of the offsets are painful to other interest groups. So. You know, while you may make the doctors happy, do you make the hospitals or the nursing homes or the pharmaceutical industry or somebody else deeply unhappy with the offsets on the other side? Um, two more questions that are in. One, uh, Lisa, how will providers be able to correct incorrect data or provide more information to the payment data released that CMS just did? Uh, you know, CMS hasn't really articulated a process for looking into that. Um, but the question in and of itself, I think, says a lot about the value of the exercise and putting the data out, that people are beginning to look through it and begin to scrutinize it. I mean, really, it speaks to the power of public reporting, if you will, and public release of data. I think it's, it's a good thing for people to be asking those questions. Um, and, uh, you know, we're happy to work with people to make sure that those types of corrections are being made to the data. One, one area that I'm really familiar with um, on quality measurement in the Medicare program, there is a you know, fairly sufficient process in place where, for example, hospitals, um, since I'm talking to mostly hospital audience on this call, hospitals are really given um, confidential feedback reports of performance before they're publicly reported on hospital compare. And in that period, hospitals are able to submit corrections 
to any of the quality measures before they're publicly reported. And so that's a process that's in place that we can look towards to model after to make sure that providers are given um, a chance to make corrections to things that are publicly reported. And here's sort of a related question. Uh, do you suspect a higher level of whistleblower complaints now that CMS has released Part B payment data? Um, I think certainly that is one of the goals that the administration articulated in release of the data. And I know that that's something that's going to continue to be a challenge for the HHS Office of the Inspector General um, in working with the public to see that. But, you know, it does seem that people are excited to be looking at the data and, um, I guess we'll just wait and see what comes out of it. So we, uh, most of the questions we got at this point obviously have been, have been written by people, but we promised you you could uh, do live questioning. So um, star one, if you have a question for Lisa, anybody holding? Yes, sir, we do have a question in the queue. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, hi, this is Jason Schaefer from HCP and Company. Thanks, guys, for putting this on. Really, really appreciate it. Um, quick question about the ALJ uh, review and just the delay there. Um, just wanted to get a little bit of your insight in terms of where you think that that's ultimately going to go um, regarding two, two factors. One, obviously there's a really big backlog um, now at the ALJ, and, and you know, that, that uh, is causing pretty significant working capital issues for a lot of uh, hospitals. So I wanted to understand if there are going to be any mechanisms put in place uh, to really speed up that review process. Uh, and then second part of the question is, has there been any discussions about changing uh, the incentives for the, the RAC auditors, um, you know, specifically regarding these high amounts of, of turnovers? Um, you know, my understanding is that about 90% uh, or so of, 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 um, of claims uh, get turned back over at the ALJ level. Uh, and that, again, that's just a very significant working capital um, uh, strain for, for a lot of facilities out there. And, and really, the RAC auditors are not um, uh, um, uh, penalized for, for really kind of erroneous um, uh, claims denials. This is Scott. Actually, let me sort of tick off a couple of those things, because I've got a couple clients up to the elbows in this, and then let Lisa give her perspective on how difficult it is to get some of these things accomplished. There's been three ideas I've heard kicked around recently. One is the idea that people who were stuck in the queue could essentially pay a fee to get to the front of the queue, um, which would give the agency more money for uh, the resources to hire other ALJ judges, and it would give people with lots of money and cash flow issues the ability to hop and get a review done early. Um, another one is to actually segregate some of the fees that um, come in to the agency as part of the penalties and redirect those or mandate, I guess I should say, that you would hire more ALJ judges. And the third thing, actually, to your last point, there's also been some suggestions that there be penalties placed for egregious claims by the RAC auditors because, as you know, right now there's no penalty. They can flag everything, and if it all gets overruled, there's no, they've got no skin in the game. Um, those are all ideas that are being kicked around on the Hill, but I don't think anybody's figured out how to get any of those done. But sort of, Lisa, I know you're getting besieged on this issue. Yeah, um, all of the things that Scott just articulated are things that a lot of people are talking about. Um, and, and I do think that you asked the question in the exact right way. We sort of have this immediate issue that needs to be taken care of because we have a two to three year backlog at the ALJ level right now for providers and it's creating massive cash flow issues. I'm really concerned about um, smaller and rural providers having their um, you know, Medicare reimbursement tied up at these levels. And so you know, in addition to some of the things that Scott articulated, there are a lot of people right now who are thinking through um, you know, sort of immediate relief of the backlog by putting together a policy that would allow providers to potentially enter into a settlement agreement where um, the settlement w would just be sort of in favor of, in the case of inpatient services, that it is an inpatient service um, without having to go to the um, inpatient through the ALJ process. Um, so it would sort of avoid that, um, and it would allow at least the U.S. Congress to um, possibly get some programmatic savings out of it because the settlement um, could be somewhere less than 100% of the inpatient rate. And so that's kind of a solution that some of us are thinking about in terms of immediate um, 
relief for the problem. But there's also, you know, what do you do with the process in the long term? Um, you know, as Scott mentioned, the uh, Medicare appeals aspect of HHS is significantly under-resourced. We probably need additional um, ALJ resources, and so we need to look at, you know, providing those types of solutions. In addition, um, asking some serious questions about the way that the recovery audit program has been um, administered and managed from the um, from CMS's perspective, and um, CMS's, you know, ability to sort of look at the underlying incentives in the inpatient and outpatient payment systems. I think all of that are, you know, solutions that we need to be thinking about sort of as a collective um, response to a very large problem. Okay, understood. Thank you. And and w one quick follow-up question. Um, Scott had, had mentioned about um, um, holding the the racks more accountable. Um, it, it, you know, is that getting any um, is that getting any momentum? And and just very quick, what is the specific concern around that? Um, I I mean, I definitely think um, that what our members sort of understand about this issue. Um, is that there are significant problems. The RACs are um, working with hospitals in a way that could be improved upon. And our members also do feel that the RAC is a really important program in terms of the money that it brings back to the Medicare trust funds. So there's sort of a balance that's in place to look at the RAC program and to make some careful modifications to it because it is an important program integrity tool that many of our members um, have supported and it's something that's been supported on a bipartisan basis um, going back to the MMA Medicare Modernization Act and then also expanded in subsequent pieces of legislation. So um, I hear you in that people do want to look at um, making reforms to the RAC program and there are you know a host of different things but even in the Medicare, you know, in the Social Security Act and the Medicare statute around timely filing requirements. And so there are a lot of pieces in place that get at um, for the recovery audit contractors. And all of those need to be reviewed as we're looking through um, the policy options. We should probably let you get back to the uh, the people's business, uh, but we wanted to thank you for your for your time with us today, and I hope that we may be able to uh, call on you again sometime. This has been an extremely valuable uh, opportunity for our clients and and for me. I learned a lot. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. Thanks, Lisa. Good luck with your negotiations, and uh, I hope you get a couple days off before everybody's back on Monday. Great, thanks. Bye, and thank you all for joining us. And that does conclude today's call. Thank you all for your participation.